Good afternoon. I'm Madhu Bakanola. I'm the faculty director of the Bernstein Center for Leadership and Ethics. And I am so excited to welcome you to today's research lightning talk. And what you'll be hearing and what we'll be sharing are um, is incredible thought leadership and research coming out of the Bernstein Center on the topics of values-based leadership, corporate social responsibility, governance, business ethics, diversity, organizational culture, and much, much more. And today's presenters are PhD students and they uh, receive Bernstein Center research grants. We tend to fund projects that are aligned with our mission and provide current and future business leaders with the tools that we know will help them lead socially responsible, socially responsible and inclusive ways. So we're gonna jump right in. Uh, we're gonna have eight talks today and they're gonna be in many kind of TED style presentations. And then two minutes of Q&A will follow each five minute talk. And please direct your question to the chat box um, and we'll monitor it throughout the gathering today. So our first speaker is Sophie Cho. She's a PhD student in the management division and she's gonna present her research project that examines values in the context of entrepreneurship. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Sophie. Great, thank you, Morupe. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Great. Um, so I just want to thank Modupe, Shirley, and the Bernstein Center for supporting my research. And I'm very excited to present my research on founders' entrepreneurial passion and value alignment in the context of young technology ventures. So entrepreneurs have discussed passion as an important precedent for the foundation growth and success of ventures. But how entrepreneurial passion affects the cultural foundation of a venture has been less understood, which is important for guiding the development path of a venture. So founders shape initial culture by adopting certain employment re relation models and strategies, but they vary in their ability to effectively instill their values in the employees at the firm. And value alignment is important because it can help with coordination, control, um, aligning goals, and increasing employee effort. So the question I have today is, can founders' entrepreneurial passion, given its empowering, persuasive characteristics, help instill values in the employees as the primary guiding principles for their behaviors? So I'm going to... Um, discuss how founders' entrepreneurial passion increase value alignment between founders and employees in the early stage, and the status such as gender of founders matter in this question. Um, for example, can a high level of entrepreneurial passion make up for having lower status um, to include increase value alignment? And also, can perceived charisma of founders serve as a mediator for the relationships? So I collected data um, on entrepreneurial pitches of founders of technology startups from YouTube for founder events such as TechCrunch Disrupt, Accelerator Applications, and so on to measure perceived entrepreneurial passion of the founders. So I used the, I, adopt, I adopted the survey from Chan Yao and Kota 2009 on um, measuring entrepreneurial passions, such as whether um, the presenters had energetic body movements, rich body language. Um, and varied tone and pitch and so on. I also asked the degree of perceived passion directly for robustness checks as well. And I also used this data to measure perceived charisma, like whether the presenters had inspiring or visionary um, ideas when presenting the pitch. I also collected data from Glassdoor um, on the employee reviews to collect a set of values that venture employees expressed. And I also collected data from Webbing Machine, which is a digital archive of websites to collect value statements from official websites of ventures from the past, from the founding stage. And I used both of these data to classify cultural values according to the 58 value items created by O'Reilly, Chenman, and Caldwell 1991 to measure the alignment between founders and employees values on these items. So just to quickly show you like the examples of the 54 items um, of values, um, there are like flexibility, adaptability, stability, um, decisiveness, and so on. 
Um, so I'm just gonna quickly kind of go through like a few case examples um, in this presentation. So the first example is a venture with founders with low passion. So it's a marketing intelligence and analytics platform founded in 2010. Um, and founders were, um, founders had the low passion score from the entrepreneurial pitch rated like 1.75 out of five. And Charisma score was also low at 1.5. And one female and one male co-founders presented the pitch. So I had about like nine founders values from the value statements from the company websites, such as being innovative, emphasizing a single culture and so on. And it turned out from the Glassdoor reviews, I found that, employee, that only two employees were matched in terms of values, um, which were offering praise for good performance and opportunities for, for, for professional growth. Um, and it was out of 35 um, employee reviews. So it had a very low value alignment. On the other hand, um, in case two, which is an online marketplace for auto services founded in 2012, founders had a high passion score from the entrepreneurial pitch, rated 4.25 out of five, and charisma score was also pretty high at 3.75, um, and one male founder presented. And there were about like seven founders values, such as flexibility, being team oriented, and so on. Um, and from Glassdoor, I found that employee values um, it was high value alignment. So 27 reviews matched out of 66 reviews, um, including being team oriented, flexibility and being supportive and being distinctive different from others. So as a next step, I'm going to be um, running like a bunch of regression models to um, test my hypothesis. I'm still in the process of collecting data on the value statements. So once I finish that, I'll run the regression models to um, validate my hypothesis. Um, so this is it. So um, thank you for listening to my presentation. And for any questions or suggestions, please feel free to email me at this email address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, and at this time, we can open it up for the audience Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter into chat or alternatively, please feel free to raise your hand and we can invite you to come off mic to ask your question. Any questions? Yes, Lisa. Hi, Sophie. Uh, very nice presentation and very interesting paper. It's not a really a question, but a more uh, comment. I don't know whether you know about this paper written by Song Ma. He's a finance uh, assistant professor at Yale University. I think a, a little bit similar, but not like I saw like a lot of extensive data collection you did, but I think his paper would also be helpful or complement to your study. Basically he also study like the video, like how entrepreneurs like in pitch to the VC investors and then persuade those VC investors and then using some machine learning techniques um, to really measure a lot of dimensions for those entrepreneurs. So I'm gonna put it out, uh, the link to that paper in the chat function, just in case it would be helpful for your study. Yeah, that'll be really helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions for Sophie? Perfect. Thank you, Sophie, again for your great presentation just now. Um, so at this time, we can turn it over to our next presenter, uh, Kim Fay Kramer. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So I think uh, Sophie's presentation was really inspiring because it talked about how entrepreneurs need their passion to perform well, right? And I always feel, I think we are a lot of PhD students here, it's like being an entrepreneur, right? You need to be really driven. You are working a lot on your own. So I think that's something like that spark of passion is what we all need in our projects as well. And the project that I'm going to present to you today really has the spark of passion for me, right? So I'm going to present to you my job market paper, bank presence and health. 
And so I want you to imagine that you are being in a small village um, or a smaller city in a developing country such as India. Right? So there's no bank in your area. That means there's low credit supply for the businesses in your area. And you yourself only have a low income job. Now, somebody from your family falls ill. Right? So you borrow because the little money that you have from your job is not sufficient to pay for a visit to the doctor. And additionally, you cannot rely on financial instruments such as savings accounts, bank loans, or even health insurance. These instruments are simply not available in your area, right? And then finally, you know that even if you could afford to go to the doctor, healthcare um, providers or healthcare supplies often are scarce and of low quality, potentially because these healthcare providers are often themselves credit constrained. Right? So you are stuck in this low equilibrium where you remain ill. So now imagine that a bank enters this area. The first thing that the bank does, what we often think about, is that it provides credit to the businesses. Right? So these businesses, now the business activity gets stimulated and you benefit from higher, higher income. And very importantly, you can use this higher income to invest in health. You can also go to the bank branch directly and ask for services such as savings accounts or bank loans who help you finance the healthcare costs. And very importantly, I'm showing in this paper that um, banks act as intermediaries between health insurance providers in faraway cities and you as a local um, household to also offer health insurance at the local bank branch. Okay. And then finally, banks potentially provide credit to healthcare providers, which allows them to improve healthcare supply. So overall, you recover quickly and remain healthy. So this small narrative gives strong motivations to believe that if we increase bank presence, there can be significant and substantial positive effects on health of households. Okay. And despite that, we don't have any causal evidence on the relationship. So in this paper, I'm asking how does bank presence affect health? And in order to causally identify that, I'm using a nationwide natural experiment. And that experiment is induced by a policy of the Reserve Bank of India, the RBI from 2005. And now the RBI really wanted to increase bank presence in very underserved areas of India, right? So it incentivized the banks to set up new branches in so-called underbank districts. And the definition of an underbank district is what allows for causal identification in my paper. An underbank district is defined as a district that has a population to branch ratio that is larger than the national average of that ratio. So that means that districts that have many people, but very few branches, very few bank branches, and this ratio is larger than the national average, they're going to be these underbank districts where the banks are going to set up extra branches. Okay? And you show this ratio, the definition of an underbank district allows for a regression discontinuity design, where the ratio is a forcing variable and the national average is the cutoff. So what exactly do I compare? Within a state, I'm going to compare first um, districts that are underbanked to districts that are banked. And I'm only going to focus on districts within an optimal bandwidth. So that's a, a feature of the RDD. And I'm first going to show you um, and investigate whether bank presence increases disproportionately in these underbank districts. So whether the policy is really biting and then I'm going to examine what happens to health. So um, we have a policy introduction in 2005, and I used two household level surveys to examine what the um, health status, how the health status of households involves. The Indian Human Development Survey, which is eight years after the six years after the policy, and the Demographic and Health Survey, eight years after the policy. Okay, to also understand a little bit more about the mechanisms, I complement this by other data sets such as the economic census. So let me give you a little preview of the findings. In the paper, I first showed that the banks indeed increase uh, the policy indeed increased bank presence in underbank districts. So that's so to speak our first stage, right? And then I'm showing that health improves. So the morbidity rate decreases. So households are significantly less likely to fall ill. Right. And along with that, I also find that they are less likely to miss work. They're less likely to have substantial medical expenses. 
So all this indicates that households are really becoming healthier. And they also find that health improves along other uh, dimensions than morbidity rates, such as vaccination rates or pregnancies. And um, so what were the mechanisms? I find evidence of almost all the mechanisms I had described to you in the beginning, except bank loans, right? And to further narrow this down, I benchmark my findings to other studies who find that savings accounts or increased income alone are less likely to be major drivers of welfare improvements. So that basically leaves health insurance and credit to healthcare providers as potentially important challenges. And so let me conclude. I provide first cause of evidence that bank uh, presence improves health and uh, highlight two previously understood aspects of banking. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Um, we've got a question from Michael here. Michael, um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, thank you, uh, Professor. So uh, I had a question about the uh, bank presence. Do you, do you mean, uh, Ms. Kramer, that's an actual physical bank branch or is it, is it, uh, can, can, because I hear a lot of things in the developing world about, uh, you know, payment systems involving cell phones and trading involving e-commerce on electronic devices and that kind of thing. Yes. So here in my study, I actually talk about actual physical bank branches. So whenever a bank wants to open a branch in India, they require a license, right? So that's basically what the RBI uses to incentivize the banks to open. They say, you can get a license in a very popular area such as Mumbai if you uh, increase your bank presence in these underbanked districts, right? And they are physical branches. Now you're completely right. There's this huge and interesting uh, trend that banking now also works with out branches, right? So for example, mobile money banking, right? So uh, this is these are really exciting trends, but they came up a little bit later than my study. And still the vast majority of people relies on these um, bank branches. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions for Kim? Thanks everybody. Great, thank you so much, Kim, again for your wonderful presentation. Um, and at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our next presenter, Kai Dong. Um, hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ting Kai Dong and I'm a fourth year PhD student in the accounting division. And in this paper, I study the impact of audited financial reporting on the local government in the US. Uh, so why this is an interesting question, um, local government in the U.S. provide essential services such as education, healthcare, transportation, and etc. And the local expenditure is not trivial. It was about 10% of the U.S. GDP in 2017, and this is only going to further increase because of the infrastructure plan. Uh, but there's a huge literature on the uh, in the political science showing that the agency issue between the elected officials and the local communities, these two inefficient uh, local government operations. Um, so the question is, how do we hold local government accountable? Um, I propose in this paper that financial reporting serves as a mechanism to uh, sort of alleviate the, the agency issue I mentioned. Uh, why? Because financial statements are written records of local government operations and they provide information with different users to evaluate not only the financial health, but also the accountability of local government. Um, so I exploit a federal regulation called the Single Audit Act, which requires any entities to prepare financial statements if the expended amount of federal grant is beyond a certain threshold. And such a threshold also increases uh, in 2015, exempting more local governments. And I focus on one particular type of local government in my uh, study for data availability reasons, and they are the school districts. So even for those school districts, I don't observe the expanded amount of federal grants if they are below the threshold. But what I do observe is the received amount of a federal grant. So I first test whether, you know, if I, I want to use the received amount as a proxy for the expanded amount, I want to make sure it's a good measure. 
So I test the correlation between two measures when both are available. And I find that the, there's a strong positive correlation between two measures. And my empirical design is a simple diff on diff. The treated school districts are exempted from financial reporting because of the threshold increase. And the, I also have two control groups. The control above has always been required to financial reporting while the control below has never been required to do so. Um, so as you can see from this uh, you know, picture here, the probability of preparing financial re uh, reporting uh, dropped the most for my treatment group compared to the other groups. Um, this is kind of the first stage uh, results. And then I also look at outcomes such as financial health ratios, teaching uh, qualities and housing prices in a simple diff in diff model. I also control for state by year fixed effect and the local government fixed effect. What I find is exempted uh, school districts become more financially distressed as measured by debt over cash ratios and expenditure over revenues. Um, I also include one control group at a time, make sure the results is not, not driven by a particular sample composition. I also find that the graduation rate drops for those exempted schools compared to the other uh, co control groups. Um, finally, I look at the outcome on the housing price because there is no available housing price measure on the school districts level. I look at a much more granular uh, geographical uh, jurisdiction called uh, census tract. And I also find a decrease in the housing price for those exempted um, uh, you know, school districts. I also uh, plot the, uh, you know, treatment effect by each year, although they are like not perfect. And I, because the, the effect of exempting financial reporting is not, a, may not be a, a, like a mirror view of the effect of having financial statements. So I, so I also corroborate some of my diff in diff results with the RDD design. As you can see, there are huge discontinuity in the reporting when you, you know, go across the threshold. And uh, finally, I think the paper contribute that the contribution of the paper is, um, I, you know, the financial reporting could serve as a mechanism to uh, improve the financial, uh, to improve the local government efficiency. Um, any questions? Great, thank you, Kai. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and come off mic. Um, I don't know how to raise my hand, but I have a question. Is it okay if I just ask it? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, King Kai. Uh, just um, call me Kai. And, um, Kai, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, in, uh, in political circles in the United States uh, that are conservative, um, people in those conservative political circles like to talk about how uh, the United States has spent a lot of money on education and uh, that the results could, are, are pretty, pretty close to say, uh, being that uh, extra money spent on education in the system that we have now uh, does not result in, well, what, 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 traditional people like to talk, conservative people like to talk about in terms of measures of increasing the effectiveness of the education. In other words, increasing test scores for uh, grammar through, through high school students and preparation for college, that kind of thing. And our secondary education system is, is, uh, is, is not keeping pace with the developed world's needs, uh, with, our, with our country's needs for keeping up with the developed world's economic requirements for the 21st century that we're in now. So given that, would you say that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that your, that your paper could speak somehow with, with this idea that you mentioned of, uh, of, uh, you know, what is it exempting school districts from becoming, you know, to, 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 to regulating and you in, in how you were saying, could help with that somehow. I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's sort of like, where I'm trying to go with that question. 
Um, thank you for the question. I think um, it, it makes sense that more expenditure doesn't always mean uh, better education. That's, I, I think that I agree with that point. So what I'm arguing in the paper is we should have some sort of uh, reporting system, financial reporting system for those uh, local governments. And they should, for example, submit their uh, you know, financial data to them and make sure it's audited, you know, it's properly done. And this could uh, you know, allow parents, for example, allow um, concerned citizens to monitor what is going on in the local governments. And that's the way how they can improve the efficiency of local governments, in this case, school districts, how the money is spent is, uh, um, is, is, is a harder question than you know, more, more, ex more is spent, yeah. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Kai, for your presentation. And at this time, I am going to turn it over to our next presenter, Nas Kunt. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm very happy to be presenting my project on the digitalization of banking efficiency versus distributive effects. And I am a fourth year PhD student in finance. And thank you so much to the Bernstein Center for, for funding this project. Uh, the motivation for my project is that you know, over the past two decades, commercial banking has really been transformed by the development of digital technologies. In particular, the banking sector spends more on technology than any other industry, and it spent over $200 billion on IT expenditures last year. Here, I'm showing a figure of the adoption of front-end digital technologies by banks. The, the blue line represents the proportion of banks that have an online uh, website, and the black and purple line are different measures of the proportion of banks that have mobile applications, which are a really crucial way that people interact with their banks these days. And so looking at this, the, the research question that I have is what are the effects of you know, this uh, like proliferation of online service platforms for the banking sector? And uh, to, to think about what, what could, uh, what this what effect this could have i focus on two key dimensions along which branch and online services differ the first is information uh, online services really erode banks ability to develop relationships but on the other hand they facilitate the collection of transactional information from customers uh, through through online platforms and then the other difference is along costs. You know, online platforms, uh, they are supplied at the bank level rather than locally at the branch level for a given market. And so they may also scale more easily in, in user traffic as, as banks get uh, more users than, than a, a bank branch would scale because then they would have to hire all these new employees for every uh, new branch. So to think about the effect that these differences may have, I, I leverage new data and a source of random variation in demand for online services to show that first, banks select into adoption depending on the importance of relationships for their lending uh, business and based on their scale. And second, after adopting uh, these technologies, banks locally substitute away from branch services. So they close their, their branches, but depending on the characteristics of their local markets and banks reduce their relationship-based loan origination. And uh, in exchange, they increase their transactional loan origination, such as mortgages that they can sell to agencies um, and you know, uh, have codified kind of characteristics. So let me show you a little bit about how I do this. The first crucial component of this project is that I hand construct granular panel data on bank services, both for branch services and online services. On the branch side, I collect public online reviews for all bank branches in the US. This is over 700,000 reviews for the 60,000 bank branches over the past decade. Um, this is very rich textual data uh, on branch service quality that has never been you know, exploited before uh, in research. And then on the other hand, I also have uh, online service quality from banks, which I, I collect from the Apple App Store and Android uh, ratings and reviews. So it's kind of a, a direct analog for every bank. I have the rating and reviews of their application. And uh, crucially, I also have their application release date, which tells me when they adopted this new technology. 
And um, so here I just have kind of a uh, latent Dirichlet allocation uh, topic bubble, uh, which shows that, you know, um, uh, one thing that you can take away from this is that uh, branch services are much more focused on relationship uh, kind of services, whereas online services on the right really focus on transactional convenience. And, um, and then the second component of, of my uh, paper is that I need to find some variation in demand for online services that uh, is uh, going to allow me to identify the effects that I'm interested in. And this is because banks that choose to adopt digital services may differ in other un uh, unobservable ways from those that do not, that can complicate my analysis when I'm trying to figure out the effects of this adoption. So what I use is the quasi-random rollout of the iPhone in the US, where it was released exclusively with AT&T for, uh, for the first five years of, of its release. And so I can identify the effect of adopting online services by comparing quite similar banks that just defer in their markets exposure to, to mobile data coverage. Um, so to summarize in this paper, I find that banks adoption of digital services may give rise to a tension between banking sector efficiency gains that comes from adopting uh, new technology uh, with the distribution uh, effects of service and credit supply. Um, and my next step is to really formalize this in a model that trades off the pass through of efficiency gains um, with the distributive welfare implications for service provision and lending. So thank you very much uh, again. Thanks. Thank you so much, Naz. Um, we've got a question from Kim. Kim, would you like to come off mic and ask your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Naz. Thank you very much for this super interesting project. So my first uh, question is, do you think, um, so they move away from relationship lending. And I think there are a lot of people who are like, maybe not that financially literate or like don't have the assets, you know, to, to like show that they maybe can get the loan. So this really depends a lot from them on the, what kind of relationship they have with their local banker to, in order to get the loan, right? So do you think that this basically puts a lot of people at a disadvantage, maybe means that they don't have access to credit anymore, they basically get excluded? Um, or are these apps potentially doing something that would even allow them to get more access to credit? And then my second um, question is, or maybe let's go with the first one and then I ask the second. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kim. Yeah, so I think, um, that's a really uh, important question. And my sense is that, you know, uh, if you think about the traditional theories of bank lending, banks are really the ones who can lend based on relationships. There's not really a, an alternative for these customers who rely on relationship-based lending because they don't have the, the hard transactional information to secure that loan. So um, my sense is that if banks reduce their relationship-based lending because of this adoption of more digital services, it would ex kind of crowd out the ability of those types of customers to, to get credit. And that's definitely something I, I want to explore more going forward. Thank you. Um, and then my second question is, so you're using this IB strategy. Um, are there other papers that use it? And I'm asking that because there are potentially effects of that um, mobile money exposure that um, affect your bank level outcomes through other ways than the adoption of the of the apps, right? That's a, that's a great question. So um, there is no paper that uses my exact identification strategy. However, there are papers that use um, a recent paper in the QJE that uses kind of variation in um, mobile data coverage in general. And uh, a way to get around the fact that, of course, mobile data coverage is not random is that they also use lightning strike frequency as kind of this exogenous variation in the ability of um, uh, like the technology to have coverage in that area. And something that helps me is that I'm focusing on the coverage of AT&T versus, for example, the coverage of Verizon. And you may think that those two companies where one covers versus the other may be somewhat random. But going forward, I definitely need to isolate a truly you know, random component of, of this coverage to, so that I can identify my yeah. effects. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but that's a great argument that it's about the horizon versus the other one. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Great, looks like Michael has a question also. Yes. Oh, this is very interesting. Oh, Michael, I don't know if you wanna. Uh... Uh, yeah, that was that was about. Thank you for taking my question, uh, Naz. Uh, yeah. The question was about Google's announcement that it's not, they're not going to become a bank. That was just in the paper the other day, and I was wondering if you had maybe some thoughts about what motivated to, them to make that decision about not become a becoming a bank. And also, the, I also typed in another question about 
synergies possibly between a bank's the digitization of the banking services and also traditional banking customer relationships if there's not some sort of synergy between the two that yes. would allow for more customer relationship service across the spectrum of banking op opportunities yeah these are both great questions so i think the google decision is very interesting um they may just I, I, in my opinion, maybe they just uh, do not think they can compete with the the the, the large uh, kind of infrastructure that like traditional banks already have. Although now there are a lot of fintech entrants, so I, I'm not uh, I, I don't have an immediate answer to that, but I think it's a very interesting uh, decision by Google. And then the I do think that there could be cost saving synergies across, you know, providing some services online and then some per services in person. But it's hard for banks to do both of these things uh, very deeply. The more services you provide online, the less you're forming a, a in-person relationship with that customer. So it's difficult to make a character-based assessment then of that customer if you, for example, uh, need to extend them alone. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Naz. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter now, um, Ran Liu. Yes, sure. Um, okay, so um, let me share my screen. Okay, um, and thanks um, for Brain Science Center to uh, found this project. And I'm very um, glad to be here to present my project, uh, Improved Data Processing and the Stock Market Liberalization in China. And in this talk, I will uh, do it in two parts. First, it's about the uh, theor theoretical importance of the, um, the information channel um, when the emerging economies liberalize their uh, capital markets. And the second part, I will speak directly to the specific case of China. So the old wisdom tells us that stock markets will evaluate when emerging economies liberalize because um, there are two ch channels. The first one reduces the cost of capital and the second one in increases the risk sharing among worldwide uh, investors. But there's a new insight, which is the information channel. And it's, bec it's becoming more and more important. This channel speaks uh, to um, price informativeness, a, a market stability, and finally, um, firm investment and also production. And this paper is the first one to quantify the information channel. And uh, the, the method I used could be generalized to um, analyze uh, the case of other countries. But for the case of China, it's estimated as uh, one sixth of the price evaluation, which is uh, remarkably large compared to the, uh, for example, the cost of capital channel is only about one over fifth. So um, this number is actually one over six number is actually really large. So um, the trick here is to differentiate data uh, with um, uh, information. So data is the, uh, the numbers we can see from uh, an annual report, uh, whatever quantities and characters on uh, which operations are performed by, uh, for example, by a computer, some agents in the market. But information is an abstract concept. It's what we get by processing the, information, uh, processing the data. It is the information that we can use directly to guide our investment. So um, there have been empirical papers looking at uh, data advantage and process advantage separately. So um, in, in domestic investors, they are said to have data advantage because they understand local culture and institution better. And they also have in, in transferable data these uh, types of um, are includes like um, information, relational um, data with the local bags, for example, and uh, underwriters. Um, however, th for the information side, foreign investors, they are normally more uh, experienced and are not subject to misleading domestic opinion on the macros of the local country. So um, to abstract from these two uh, advantages, I um, formulize these two perfect imperfections. So um, the first one is technological restriction. So the domestic institutional investors, they have a higher variance in their price signals. 
why there's a data uh, restriction placed on the foreign institutional investors because they can only acquire data um, from a transferable source. So um, there's a conflict of uh, that in that the, uh, the agents who are with the best available data um, do not own the best available technology. And it's, it's interesting to see uh, what will happen. So generally, price informativeness increases when the size of the institutional investors increases. So this is generally the case when uh, the emerging markets open to the world. And if, if price informativeness is high with capital market opening, if data are sufficiently informative. However, the results on a market, a market um, volatility um, a, it is more uh, mixed. So um, because of the time uh, restriction, uh, I'm gonna talk about China's case. So um, China case is itself is very important because um, it has a large, very large market and it's very, very different than the, China, than the US stock market. Um, it's very interesting to see, um, let's see uh, what will happen when the Chinese market further opens. So what we have now is the 2014 and 2016 storm on Connect. So um, it has huge market impact here. You can see from the 2014. However, China is still on its way to uh, further um, open its capital markets. So what will happen is first, um, local branch of foreign institutions will acquire local data and the local institutions implement uh, perfect data processing and of course, we will have a uh, increased capital inflow to China. So, uh, if we um, double the increased, uh, double the ca current capital flow, I can forecast the uh, price informativeness will further increases at about uh, eleven percent, while the volatility goes down, which is very remarkable, at uh, about twenty-three percent. Okay, and um, this is. Um, Everything that I want to see. And um, is there any question? Thank you, Ron. Um, Thank you. This time we'll take questions from the audience. If there aren't any questions, we can go ahead and move on to our next presenter, okay. Mayan Malter. Needed to unmute. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm a fifth year in the marketing division, and this is my project, Counterfactual Culpability. Thinking about what you could have done increases false culpability for your actions. So I study trade-off decisions, and what's really important and interesting about trade-offs is that each of the options has both a cost and a benefit, and each option favors a different value. So it's not clear what is definitely the better of the options. So for example, currently in society, we have the COVID-19 vaccine and policymakers need to decide if there should be vaccine mandates. On one hand, a mandate limits the spread of the virus, but on the other hand, mandates limit personal freedom. So I study trade-off decisions in a number of business and policy contexts. And we as actors, we act on trade-offs all the time, but sometimes we make our own decision of which option uh, to act on. And at other times we're told what to do by someone else and we're simply following orders. And so what I'm really interested in is how does making your own decision versus following orders influence how you feel about the outcome of these trade-offs. More specifically, how responsible, guilty, and regretful will you feel for the outcome? And it conceptualized these three constructs under one sort of umbrella feeling of culpability. 
So in my previous research with my co-authors, Sonia Kim and Janet Metcalf, we studied this question in the context of programming autonomous vehicles. And what we found was super surprising. We found that actually not making the decision oneself, so having it decided by a superior, increased feelings of culpability. And so in today's project, I really wanna dig deeper into why this is happening. Why does having low agency, just following orders, lead to greater culpability? And I had two hypotheses. The first, that acting against one's personal or political beliefs increases culpability. And the second, that engaging in counterfactual thinking increases culpability. So due to time, I'm just gonna show one experiment. And this experiment was run a little over a year ago when the big, big question in society was how was the 2020 school year going to look? Was it going to look like the picture on the left uh, or was it going to look like the picture on the right? And policymakers had to make this really tough decision. So I asked participants, imagine that you're a superintendent of a school district. And as superintendent, you need to implement a policy of either online or in-person school. So they read about the pros and the cons of each of these two policy options. And then they were randomized into one of two conditions. So either they had high agency and they were told that as superintendent, they needed to choose and implement one of the two options. And I asked for their choice. In the other condition, they had low agency, and they were told that the governor of their state issued a mandate that all schools needed to either be in person or online. And this was randomized amongst low agency participants. They then read about a negative outcome of the policy that they implemented. And then I asked for their feeling of culpability for that negative outcome of their actions. So, my hypothesis was that acting against one's, in this case, political beliefs, increases culpability. And I knew that this, this question of should schools be online or in person was highly, highly politically polarized. So I asked for their political affiliation. And with both the policy they implemented and their political affiliation, I create a new variable that I call belief action. So this matrix explains belief action. So if you're a Democrat, and you implemented an online policy, you have a belief action match. And if you implemented a Democrat and implemented in person, you have a belief action mismatch. And the opposite was true for Republicans. So I have two factors, agency, high or low, and belief action match versus mismatch. And what I find is two main effects. First, I find that those who had low agency, just followed orders, had higher culpability. So this replicates the previous finding. But more importantly, for this experiment, I find that in both low agency and high agency, if you acted against your political party's beliefs, you felt more culpable. So a mismatch between beliefs and actions increases felt culpability. So for the second hypothesis, engaging in counterfactual thinking increases culpability. So counterfactual thinking occurs when you act against the normative behavior. So if you have a normal commute home from work and one day you deviate, you're gonna have more thoughts about that normal commute. So if you have a belief action mismatch, you acted against your political beliefs and that's going to increase thoughts about the normative beliefs action. So increased thoughts about the outcome would have been better if I had implemented the other policy. So this is upward counterfactual thinking. And I predicted that this would mediate the relationship between a mismatch between beliefs and actions and felt culpability. And the mediation was significant. Um, so I can say that this counterfactual thinking is what's driving, what's underlying the relationship between acting against one's beliefs and feeling culpable. So that's all we have time for today. Um, I'd love to take questions. If we don't have time, you can also send them to me. Offline. Thank you so much, Mayan. Um, we do have a couple minutes to take questions. So okay. if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions? 
Thanks, man. I thought that was super interesting. Um, I had a quick question. So who were who the people that you were interviewing? Um, yeah. yeah. So in the data set that I showed you just now, it was MTurkers. Um, I ran another experiment about the same question of in-person versus online, where I actually collected responses from parents who had to make this decision for their own child. And we find similar results between sort of the more anonymous m Turker population, as well as a population of people that really had this, this decision was extremely important to them personally. I And really interesting. I just had a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. So do you give, um, like monetary incentives uh, to, because then that can bias their responses, right? Either way, or do you think that doesn't play a role here? Monetary incentives to participate in the experiment in general or based on yeah. what they choose. Um, so the m turkers were paid, I believe 75 cents to take this survey. Um, and the parents who had taken it in a separate study, they, they simply did it um, on a volunteer basis and we see similar results. So I don't think that the monetary incentive changed how they felt. Okay. Are there any other questions for Maya? Okay, great. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter, um, who is Frinda Nittal. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm Vrinda, and uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student in finance. And today I'll be presenting uh, pension funds, deluge firms, and rise of private markets. So um, when we think about pension funds here, I'm referring to public pension funds. Think about CalPERS or New York. Uh, teachers or New York State retirees. Um, these plans are offered by the state and local governments. And what we see is that they have increased investments in private equity over time. So in about 2001, uh, their al average allocation to private equity was 3%. And now in 2020, it's about 9% here. And this is visible across the pension funds, right? So here, if you see on the x-axis, I have different state and local pension funds. And on the y-axis, I have the private equity allocation as of December 2020. And here, when you see the size of the bubble corresponds to the size of the pension. And so from left to right, I'm actually moving from like the bigger pensions to smaller pensions. So what I wanted to take away from this is that pension funds are increasingly allocating to private equity, and this is the case across public pensions in the US. While at the same time, what we see is that financing for firms via the non-bank sector, and here I refer to non-bank as private equity, mainly has increased. And so what I want to address is what implications this has for the real economy, right? So what one would ideally expect is that the source of capital shouldn't matter. Like it shouldn't matter for the firms whether they're getting funding from a pension fund or an insurance company. But what I show is that that's not the case. Um, so why do we care about this? They're basically significant assets under, they're basically significant assets under management in private markets and public pensions are holders of household wealth in the US and they're major contributors to this private market. And in principle, public pensions can take on more risk because currently they are 1% under allocated in private markets. And also in the US, the private, the, the firms which are backed by private markets have really risen from, from about, uh, by about 106% from 2006 and the public companies have decreased since 1996. So what is the question I ask here? I ask what is the real footprint of this rise in investment demand by public pensions in alternative assets on firm size, profitability, and financial risk, right? So basically what I ask is that why is there a difference in allocation of capital in the first place? And what is driving the difference in firms which is getting capital from public pension funds versus the other funds? And what I provide is an explanation based on difference in intermediary investing style. So just to give you a quick overview about the methodology, I use 
very novel micro data, and I want to thank Bursting Center for this, uh, where I can track investments uh, from the end investor to the end borrower. And I can observe their names, uh, how much they invest, where the funds are going, and I can tra track the transaction level deals for all the investors in the world from 1970 to today. And using an event study on the firm's first year of getting capital from private markets, I study the effects on the firm's size, leverage, and profitability. So let me give you a brief overview of my main findings. Uh, I show that pension funds uh, are increasingly increasing the allocation to private equity, which is driven by their underfunded positions and low interest rates. What I also show that pension funds provide patient capital. That means that public pensions receive delayed returns as compared to other investors. And just to give you an idea of what I'm referring to is like here on the x-axis, I have the months since the inception of the fund. And on the y-axis, you can think of this uh, as um, a return measure. And what I see is the purple line is the returns to public pensions and the orange is the return to all the other investors. And public pensions receive return later on, right? And so what I also find is that this capital is reliable in the sense that public pensions provide capital later on during in the duration of the fund. And hence private equity funds use patient and public cap and reliable capital to support ex ante smaller firms. And these firms drastically increase their profitability on the y-axis on the right-hand side and their leverage on the left-hand side. Um, and that's it to conclude. Uh, I use micro data on investments and deals in private markets to study the flow of capital in this opaque uh, and non-transparent market. And I see that uh, public pensions are providers of patient and reliable capital which is then used by private equity funds to fund smaller firms. And this has implications for changing risk in the economy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frinda, for that wonderful presentation. Um, at this time, we will take any questions that anyone might have from the audience. Yes, Kim. Sorry, Kim, I cannot hear you. You're on my, you're on me. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So my first question is, um, so you said that public pension funds can take on more risk, um, but I don't know, it, it seems to me that they shouldn't take too much risk, you know, because at least like they are handling people's pensions. Um, so where did this trend coming from? Did they move into private equity? And do you think it's even like excessive in the sense that they're taking too much risk? Um, and then I could you that, tell us? Yeah. And then could you tell us a little bit more about? Um, so it's an event study. Um, what's like? I, I guess the first year, like they get private equity. Also, a lot of other things happen. So how do you disentangle that? No, that's a very, thank you. This is a this is a very important debate. Like as you mentioned in the chat, this is um, so extremely important. So public pensions, what I see is are increasing the allocating to private equity, and they're reducing the allocation to fixed income. So private equity has gone up, say, 10 percentage points, and fixed income has gone down. Their allocation to public equity is still very high. And when I say that they're, in principle, they can take a lot of risk, what I mean by that is that they have to report their target allocation to private equity means what they target to achieve and also what they're currently allocating. So what, I'm, what I mean is like they're 1% under allocating relative to their target. And I think you're completely right that this is very risky for the economy. And it is very concerning, actually, which is what made me interested in this project as well. Um, regarding your second question, uh, so I went over that really quickly because of time, but the idea is that I'm taking the first year a firm gets financing from private markets as year zero, and I see three years after and three years before. There are other papers in the literature, uh, one of them by Olivier, which uh, studies this in the corporate bond market. So basically, this is a similar technique, which I'm borrowing from that literature. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Brenda, again. Um, up next is our eighth and final presenter of the day, um, Quinn Wong. Thank you, everyone's slide. Can I raise my slides? Okay, thank you. 
Um, thank you everyone for staying for my presentation. I also want to thank the Bernstein Center for their generous support. My project is titled Foreign Currency Adjustments in Executive Compensation. Accounting researchers have studied executive compensation um, closely. One of the reasons is that accounting-based performance metrics such as revenue and profits are widely used in those contracts. Since 2009, we have seen another trend and that is the increased use of the non-gap performance metric um, for executive, executive compensation. So the non-gap metrics uh, are uh, start from gap accounting numbers mm -hmm. and make certain adjustments mm -hmm. and um, they exclude certain items to arrive to the bottom line number. Mm -hmm. So this paper is motivated by looking at what firms do with this uh, with this non-gap uh, metrics in their compensation contract. In particular, mm -hmm. I noticed that some firms uh, some firms exclude foreign mm -hmm. currency impacts from their compensation contract, while other firms do not. And this led me to wonder why. So my research question is that, why do some firms exclude our currency impacts from um, their um, accounting-based performance matters, while others do not? And what is the consequence of such adjustment? To put it differently, I'm interested in, um, to understand whether including foreign currency effects in managerial performance evaluation is useful or not. So intuition suggests both ways. Um, um, the firms should include foreign currency impacts because um, foreign currency fluctuations affect firms' accounting performance, such as profits, and this is what shareholders care about. Uh, on the other hand, firms should exclude foreign currency impacts because foreign currency fluctuations are beyond manager's control. If you add yen um, to the performance matter, you are simply adding noise. But both arguments ignore managers' response to foreign currency fluctuations and thus fail to appreciate when and why um, act, uh, foreign currency actually matters. I argue that the goal of compensation contracts is to motivate managers to take value creation actions, generally long-term, rather than focusing on short-term accounting numbers, um, accounting outcomes. So this basically suggests that uh, we should um, take um, the compensation contract should consider how uh, foreign currency fluctuations affect managers' decision making. One key feature of foreign currency is that managers cannot predict short term uh, for, uh, cannot predict short term exchange rate, and thus they have to make um, um, decisions under under uncertainty. And also take into consideration the optionality created by foreign currency fluctuations. So in order to incorporate uh, foreign currency fluctuations into managers' decision making, I develop a model based on option pricing theory in a continuous time framework. So the key element of my model is what I call the integration level. So integration level basically means um, the extent to which um, the parent and its foreign subsidiaries are having coordinated activities or cross-border transactions. So a high integration firm um, means that um, means that they work together on um, subsidiaries work together with the parent. So think about a car a, a car manufacturer. Generally, different uh, generally um different auto parts can come from different locations, and they have to come together in order to make the final product. Well, on the other hand, a low integration um, firm generally operate uh, makes and sells uh, in one location. So think about a firm that produce non-durable uh, consumer products such as restaurant. So the key insights of the model is that uh, foreign currency fluctuations affect decision-making for firms with high integration level because um, the real option created um, by, um, by foreign currency fluctuations has value. The model implication to taken together is that foreign currency fluctuations should be included in executive compensation for firms that have high integration level between the parent and its foreign subsidiaries. And that translates to my empirical hypothesis. Firms with high integration level are less likely to exclude foreign currency impacts from compensation contracts. In order to corroborate my model, I use a, a sample of US multinationals for fiscal year 2007 to 2019. I search firms' policy statement in order to, um, to get whether they exclude foreign currency impact or not. 
I further um, used two set, um, two data set, and one is the segment disorder, and one is that uh, one is the orbit data, in order to find proxies for integration level. Preliminary results based on um, inter-segment revenue elimination support my um, support my model prediction and also my hypothesis. To conclude, I propose that an uh, extent of coordinated activities between the parent and the foreign subsidiary, which I call integration level, can be an explanation for the inclusion and, uh, and exclusion decision. So on average, firms consider foreign currency fluctuations to make corporate decisions. So the usage of foreign currency adjustment in effective compensation is less likely to be a result of managerial opportunism. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm sorry for the noise. On my on my end, it's a it's a sound of noise, and I have no time to move. I apologize for that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Quinn. Um, this is the virtual world these days. We just got to roll with it. Um, so at this time, I am happy to open it up for questions. And I see Brenda, you've got a question for Quinn. I think this is a very interesting project, Quinn. Actually, I just had a follow up. Maybe like this was just a suggestion more than a question. What might be also interesting is to do like a within industry analysis of what you're doing. Like, so I would expect this result to be stronger for the finance industry, for instance, where firms are more multinational and, um, you know, like they have, they have locations in different areas, uh, even like different regions, different countries, as compared to maybe like local firms or, uh, uh, I, I'm not too sure, but maybe like manufacturing also, which I expect to be a little more concentrated in like two or three countries maybe. Well, thank you so much for the suggestion. So um, first of all, I actually don't have finance, uh, financial firm in my, in my sample because I'm focusing on firms that actually have some real operating decision rather, rather than financial firm that have um, decisions that are very different from manufacturing company, for example. But then what you were talking about in terms of concentration is definitely something um, that it, that it's important. So I do have a list of um, um, their com the company's um, subsidiaries. So I, there are definitely certain companies that are uh, located more widely and have several hundreds of subsidiary across the world. And then there are some uh, companies that have relatively um, low concentration and they only have say subsidiary in Canada. So one thing um, in my paper is that I make sure that all those firms have foreign subsidiary at least in one location in order to study the fact between different um, different foreign currencies. Thank you. Thank you. Great, are there any other questions? If not, um, thank you everyone for the wonderful presentations. And I'm going to pass it over to Professor Akinola for her closing remarks. Yes, well, thank you all again. And, you know, we do have a couple more minutes. So uh, we were intending to end at 1.30. Um, I always think it's nice to hear a little bit more about what you wish you had more of maybe as a PhD student in the project you're working on or one of the biggest challenges that you kind of like overcame in this project? Because as somebody did mention, you know, you are entrepreneurs. And so I think it's really important to hear about the whole process to the extent people can, because this is, it's a lot of work. So anyone want to share anything that was like a big triumph for them or something that they're so excited about or anything um, in that realm with this work that you're working on? I mean, we would say it's a roller coaster. You know, um, there are a lot of days where you feel it's an absolute disaster. There's a lot of days where you feel excited about it and things actually work out. So if you're currently like stuck at the valley, like be sure that there's gonna be a it's gonna go uphill again. And then um, yeah, also I think like um, I think having a, a sense of community is really important. Like sharing your experiences with other people. So true, especially after having, I don't know if many of you watched the marathon on Sunday, but yes, it is a marathon and not a sprint. So um, keep going through those roller coasters. And I always like to say, uh, there's beauty in the data. I just need to find it, you know, because it's there. It's just us having, you know, creativity. It's not just entrepreneurship, but also creativity. 
what else? Who is excited about a particular way they're gonna spend some of this funding? Anyone wanna share that? Yeah, so this isn't exactly answering um, that, but I know that some, I think Naz and um, maybe Brenda had asked me about um, the participants and who I used. And so most of my studies are using MTurk or other online panels. And so it was really important to me um, to also have like quote unquote real decision makers or people who are actually engaging in the particular type of decision that I'm asking them about. And so I had um, put so much effort into uh, collecting the real parent data and that was great. I'm really proud of that uh, experiment. But I think finding other sort of sources of real decision makers, especially like in the business world and sort of having, you know, some sort of I maybe help with, you know, from, I don't know if it's the Bernstein Center or other centers um, within the schools to how to connect us to companies, to, um, to people in the business world to sort of apply what, you know, the research that we're doing, especially on the sort of the behavioral side um, of things that we do on just your normal individual to someone who's specifically very engaged in the problem we're studying. Absolutely. I think the whole like business meets practice and having uh, forums where practitioners can spend time with us knowing what we're doing and um, sharing their problems. I'm actually in one of them with chief diversity officers and we just had a two day meeting last week or a couple hours a day. And it was so, they were so excited to hear about the research and our next session is gonna be really like brainstorming about what we can do together. And so this idea of how can we make sure that what we're doing is applicable and can we get the samples that we need as Maya mentioned yeah. is huge. Um, and a, a special shout out to Michael here who is one of our um, CBS alums and SEPA grads and you know a, in practice. So um, it, it's always great to see you here. We appreciate your questions. Anyone else wanna share anything before we wrap up? So I, I think um... Like for me, like because I'm studying private equity and private markets, I think I've learned a lot by talking to people in the industry because it, they just know the nuances, like it's their job. Like, so I think uh, similar to what Mayan said, but probably not on the data front, but more like having industry talks for PC students, just to maybe just connect with them. I know there's this huge MBA alumni network, um, but maybe more hands-on panel discussions for our students, maybe that would be helpful. I love that. I really love that idea. And we do have um, some of our leadership here too um, with Bernstein. So maybe we'll put something together that's, uh, you know, practitioners identifying some key problems that they hope we as researchers can address um, with a focus on PhD students. I love this. Well, listen, thank you all for sharing your wonderful research. Um, it was really, really great to hear what you've been up to, and we're so excited for you to find or continue finding the beauty in the data and coming up with innovative and creative ways to solve and address some of these key problems. And thank you, everyone else, for attending our annual Research Lightning Talks. It means a lot to have support and to see um, you here, so thank you for that. Special thanks to Shirley and Tracy for all they did to organize this. And we really hope to see you again at our next event, which is on Monday, November 22nd at 5 p.m. It features a panel of experts from academia and uh, industry. And they're gonna be focusing on addressing economic inequality and potential solutions. So we hope you will join us then. And thank you again for being here today. Have a great rest of the afternoon.